Welcome to Hand Surgery Resources YouTube video on Dubitron disease, a historical review. Before we begin our discussion and review of the history of Dubitron disease, we should review some important historical medical achievements so we can keep the history of Dubitron disease in a proper perspective. Early physicians and surgeons relied on history taking, observation, limited examination skills, and even cruder examination tools to diagnose their patients. Early healers working around the time of Hippocrates had limited learning opportunities. Dissecting animals and human cadavers provided an educational opportunity. In Greece, human dissections were done by Herophilus of Chalcedon and Aristratus of Ceus around 350 to 225 BC. These dissections abruptly and mysteriously disappeared after their deaths. Some say they were accusations of vivisection. In the Middle Ages, the church prohibited human dissection. Dissection of the human body only reappeared in the 14th century and became more commonplace in the 17th to 19th centuries. Modern diagnostic tools like the stethoscope, diagnostic x-ray, MRI, and medical ultrasound were unavailable before the 20th century. The x-ray was discovered by accident by Wilhelm Conrad Rankin in 1895, well after Guillaume Dupuytren performed his first fasciotomy in 1831. Historically, we should realize medical ultrasound only became available in 1956 and MRI in 1971. The usefulness of these modalities in hand and the musculoskeletal system in general only became apparent during the last two to three decades. Given these historical medical science realities, Perhaps it isn't surprising that the historical record of Dupuytren's disease is so thin before the 19th century. Before we move on to look at the timeline of Homo sapiens and Dupuytren's disease, let's review some additional reasons that may have minimized the historical references to this unique disorder. The Earth was born 4.5 billion years ago, with life forms first appearing 3.5 billion years ago. Homo sapiens began to walk the earth 300,000 years ago. Recent studies show a strong genetic basis for Dupuytren's disease. The Wnt pathway plays an important role in the genetics of this disorder. Given that 95% of the human genome has remained hardwired and unchanged since the beginning, and Dupuytren's disease has a strong genetic basis, why is there so little historical evidence of Dupuytren's disease before the 17th century? One explanation for the scant records of Dupuytren's disease before the 18th century relates to the low incidence of this disorder. The world population of 600 million in 1700 is tiny compared to the 7.8 billion population of 2020. The current estimated incidence of Dupuytren's disease is 1 to 3 percent of the white population. Further, the white population represents only 16% of the overall population. Therefore, in 1700, there may have only been 60,000 individuals with Dupuytren's disease in the whole world, and there were no hand surgeons dedicated to identifying and treating this problem. There simply were fewer people with this orphan disease in these early centuries. Another observation that may explain the minimal records of Dupuytren's disease is the limited average longevity of humans in the 17th century and earlier. Except for some elite and wealthy class humans, most individuals did not live long enough to develop clinically notable Dupuytren's disease. In the 17th century, the average longevity was less than 40 years. The work of Nicholson and others clearly shows that the incidence of Dupuytren's disease rises with age. Thus, our current world population with an average age of 80 has a significantly greater opportunity for Dupuytren's disease to show clinically than would be seen in our ancestors who only lived to age 40. Historical factors which put Dupuytren's disease in the proper perspective. Let's take a walk along the timeline of man and see the historical evidence that has been left behind regarding Dupuytren's disease. The first pyramids in Egypt appeared in 2600 BC, the prehistoric period. One of the earliest indications of Dupuytren's disease was published in 2009 by Garcia, Guiette, and Goma. In 2006, this archaeological team ran the Matunhat project, which studied the era from 1070 to 664 BC and analyzed 18 mummies from ancient Egypt. In an adult male mummy, 165.3 centimeters in length, 
with reddish hair, this team identified pathology in the left hand consistent with Dupuytren's disease. There's no degenerative disease in this mummy. The mummies in the study were the, from the third intermediate period of ancient Egypt between the year 1070 BC and 664 BC. If Dupuytren's disease did exist in Egypt, how did this disease become commonplace in Northern Europe? A possible explanation may be the legend of Queen Skada. Skada was the daughter of an Egyptian pharaoh who married a Celtic chieftain, Galtheosis, son of a Greek king. Skada and her husband migrated from North Africa across the Straits of Gibraltar, which are eight miles wide at this point, and then moved into the Iberian Peninsula, which is part of Spain. The Celts, who built Stonehenge, arrived in Ireland in 400 BC. As we continue along the timeline of man, we have to look carefully for additional historical evidence of Dupuytren's disease. The next citation of possible Dupuytren's disease comes from the sagas of Iceland and Orkney in the 12th and 13th centuries. These stories describe miracle treatments by the priests of the time, and it appears that these were cases of Dupuytren's disease which they were treating. Finding evidence of Dupuytren's disease before the 15th century was hampered by the absence of written documents. Written manuscripts depended on the transcription efforts of monks. Few individuals could write or read. All this changed in 1440 when Gutenberg invented his printing press. Suddenly knowledge began to spread further, wider, and faster. The next historical evidence of Dupuytren's disease came from the anatomists. As you recall, the Greek anatomists who did human dissections in the 3rd century disappeared around the time of the burning of Alexandria in 389. The Catholic Pope's laws and public opinion minimized the use of human dissection until the late Renaissance in the 16th century, when the work of Andreas Vercellius, who lived from 1514 to 1564, did his excellent anatomic work. Also at this time, the mid palmar fascia and palmaris longus were identified by Giovanni Canavis in 1543. Others, like Fabricius, who lived from 1533 to 1619, also shed important light on human anatomy and the study of human anatomy. Fabricius built the first permanent public anatomic theater in Padua, Italy in 1594. Even in his time, the church, the laws, and real ethical problems like grave robbing meant precautions had to be carried out. The theater's dissecting table opened to the river below for quick removal of dissected parts. Interestingly, one of his students, William Harvey, who lived from 1578 to 1657, the great English anatomist who first described the circulation of the blood, also studied at Padua. Felix Platter, who lived from 1536 to 1614, was an anatomist, botanist, herbalist, physician, psychiatrist, and Dean of the School of Medicine at Basel, Switzerland. Platter wrote two important books, his treasured pathology book, De Corpitus Humani Structura, and his Observatium in Humanis Affectibus, published in 1614. In the third volume of this book, Platter described a stonemason with a contracture of the fourth and fifth fingers and skin changes all consistent with Dupuytren's disease. David Elliott and other early historians, according to Belusa et al., misinterpreted the Latin text that had been written by Felix Platter, stating that the contractures were secondary to flexure tendon problems in patients with Dupuytren's disease. Belusa's team stated that Felix Platter had proven that the contracture was secondary to a contracture of the palmar aparosis some 150 years before Klein, Cooper, and Dupuytren himself. While the Anglo-Saxon monks documented some hand ailments, no specific writings about Dupuytren's disease have been found in that era. One exception is the story that began in the 15th century and wove its way through three centuries as the tale of the curse of the Macrumans. This curse may be an historical clue and hampering for the existence of Dupuytren's disease in this era. Note the finger extension needed for bagpiping. In the 15th century, Scotland was organized by clans led by chieftains, whose Scottish bagpipes were part of the clan leadership until the Scottish Jacobites were defeated at Coden, and the Appalachian Act of 1747 declared that they were simple physicians. The Macrumans of the Isle of Sloop carried on running Piper's College, but their own careers were sometimes cut short by finger flexion deformities that appear to be Dupuytren's contractures and made it impossible for them to play. 
The flexion posture of the fourth and fifth digits during the papal blessing, or as it is also known, the sign of benediction, is suggestive of Dupuytren's disease. However, this gesture has its origins in Greek and Roman history, and is most likely not related to an early pope with Dupuytren's disease. Further, this gesture may have early origins in the cultures of the Thracians and Phrygians. They worship the god Sabatias, and the artifacts of the Hand of Sabatias go back to the 15th to the 19th centuries BC. The Hand of Sabatias positions the fourth and fifth digits in inflection, just like what we see so frequently in Dupuytren's disease. But whether this is the disease or a cultural gesture is unknown. Hunter, who lived from 1728 to 1793, was born in Scotland. This anatomist surgeon was the founder of the scientific approach to surgical procedures and education. He was also called the father of British surgery. His amazing teaching talents ultimately helped shine a light on Dubitron's disease through his famous student, Henry Klein. Henry Klein, who lived from 1759 to 1826, was a well-known London surgeon. Klein dissected two hands with contracted fingers. He clearly described the fascia, that is the ligament theca, and not the flexor tendons as the cause of the finger contracture. He proposed cutting the theca to correct the contracture. This dissection was performed in 1777, the year of Dupuytren's birth. Klein's work was documented in his student's Windsor and Smart's notes of 1808. Windsor noted Dr. Klein stated that the contracture of the finger arising from the thickening and shortening of the fascia in the palm of the hand without shortening in the muscles and tendons. Smart added, finger contractures most frequently in the little finger. This is found to arise from thickening and shortening of the ligamentum theca, which covers the tendons of the flexor muscles, and can be remedied by operation that divides the theca. All of these findings were brilliantly summarized in Dave Elliott's work in 2015 on the history of Dupuytren's disease. Ashley Cooper, who lived from 1768 to 1841, also described Dupuytren's disease and its surgical treatment. Henry Klein's student, Cooper, was also a gifted lecturer. Cooper eventually became Klein's colleague, and they lectured together for two decades. In his book, A Treatise on Dislocations and Fractures of the Joints, in 1822, Cooper clearly described Dupuytren's disease and its surgical treatment. However, given the lack of anesthesia and the potential for death from sepsis, Dupuytren's surgery remained relatively uncommon. Ashley Cooper treated Palmer contracture by percutaneous fasciotomy using a pointed bistory, later known as Cooper's knife. Cooper was one of the most famous anatomist surgeons of his era. He was known for constantly doing animal and human dissections. In England, bodies from executions were legally used for this purpose, but with only 80 executions per year, the anatomist surgeons were secretly aligned with the business of grave robbing. Dupuytren was born in 1777, the same year that Henry Klein described Palmer fibromatosis during his dissections in London. Only 12 years after his birth, the French King Louis XVI eliminated the barber surgeons and decreed that surgeons were medical professions and that surgery should be taught in medical school. Dupuytren grew up in Pierre Baffier in western central France in a small village with less than 2,000 people. At the time of his birth, the area contained a few landed gentry and an impoverished population. Dupuytren's father was a lawyer. Guillaume Dupuytren was his only son. Dupuytren's character seemed to be an enigma of conflicting behaviors. He was known to have an active social life. His friendship with Rothschild connected him to many famous musicians, writers, and artists of his time. Yet some would describe him as first a surgeon, yet last as a man, while he was still liked by many. At an early age, Dupuytren was sent to Paris to become a surgeon. In 1788, the Hotel Du was the center of medical education. This hospital had over 20,000 admissions per year. At times, there were four patients per bed, and two out of each nine patients admitted died. By 1794, Dupuytren's was established in Paris, and he married. His daughter, Adeline, was born in 1811. Dupuytren's career partially paralleled Napoleon's and overlapped the French Revolution. In 1815, Napoleon was defeated at the Battle of Waterloo. After this, he abrogated the Emperorship of France and moved on to exile. The end of the Napoleonic era and the French Revolution forever changed the political landscape of France and the world that Dupuytren worked in. Throughout the time of war and revolution, Dupuytren treated numerous traumatic injuries. 
Dupatron's famous hospital was called the Hotel Du, or as others would call it, the House of God, or the Hostel of God. In Dupatron's day, the Augustine sisters were the nursing staff. The hospital was founded in 651 by Saint Landy, the 28th Bishop of Paris. In Dupatron's era, becoming the surgical leader was a very competitive pursuit. In 1802, Dupatron won the title as head of surgery at Hotel Du in Paris by beating out his colleague P.J. Roax, who later followed him as head of the hospital. In his day, Dupatron was clearly a workaholic. He rarely left Paris. In 1818, he consulted on over 2,300 patient admissions, saw over 10,000 patient visits, and did 764 surgeries. He clearly was a top surgeon of his era. He was proud of his surgical death rate of only 1 in 14. Dupatron was aware of the risk of surgery in an era when infection was recognized but not understood and anesthesia did not exist. He would not operate just to operate and strongly believed that a good diagnosis was the basis of good treatment. Dupatron's day started at 6 a.m. with rounds, lectures, and surgeries. He was paid 80 francs per month. The sisters gave him a two-penny loaf each day at noon. His private practice, however, was lucrative. His friend, Baron James de Rothschild, helped him amass a small fortune. On June 12, 1831, Dupatron performed his first pulmonary fasciotomy. This historical event was documented by his students in their writings regarding his Lison Oriale, or in English, his oral lessons. This story, entitled Clinical Lectures on Surgery, is available in the 1833 translation done by A. Sidney Dolan. The complete chapters on Dupatron's disease and Dupatron's surgery are available at Hand Surgery Source at www.handsurgeryresource.org. By the time of his death in 1835 at the age of 58, the French surgical historians were calling his career the Dupatron's Age. He had been the surgeon of kings and numerous noble friends. Ultimately, streets were named after him and statues erected in his honor. After Dupatron's death, other French surgeons carried on the study and treatment of Dupatron's disease. Coiran, in 1833, presented to the Royal Academy of Medicine in Paris that the disease was not limited to the palm, but involved the skin and the fibrous tissues in the digits. He also questioned the theory that repetitive trauma caused the contracture, and introduced the theory that heredity played a role. Further, he observed that Dupatron's disease was not restricted to the ulnar side of the hand. Because of the fibrous bands in the finger, Goran recommended longitudinal incisions. When critiquing Ryan's work, Sensen proposed that the finger bands were from proliferation of the fibrocellular tissue normally in the digits. During the 60 years that followed Dupatron's death, the French surgeons Sanson, Velpo, Les Franks, and others all continued to discuss Dupatron's disease. All seemed relatively unaware of J. Whitburke anatomy work from 1742 and Barthlin's work from 1668. Both of these anatomists described the fibrous structure of the fingers much earlier. Further, the surgeons of the late 19th century already had started the debates regarding the skin involvement in Dupatron's disease, the traumatic ideology of Dupatron's disease that still continue today. Studies and investigations were followed later by Cleanland's work in 1878 in Glasgow, where he worked as the Regis Professor of Anatomy and wrote his paper, The Cutaneous Ligaments of the Phalanges. Despite the continued interest in Dupatron's disease, Cooper's closed surgical treatment remained the treatment of choice for most surgeons until after Lister's introduction of antisepsis in 1865 and the introduction of either anesthesia by Crawford Long uh, in March 30, 1842 in Georgia, and Dr. William Morton working at the Mass General in Boston in October 16, 1846, introduced ether anesthesia. Pain control during surgery was also further advanced by the introduction of cocaine regional blocks, which were introduced in 1884 by Carl Kohler for eye surgery. As these anesthetic advances developed, the surgical management of Dupatron's disease moved much more towards extensive open surgical fasciectomies with an attempt to cure Dupatron's disease by the radical surgical approach. 
As the 19th century came to an end and the 20th century began, numerous surgeons popularized wide and radical excision for Dupuytren's disease with a variety of surgical approaches. Further, anatomic studies also continued, like that of J. Grayson, who wrote The Cutaneous Ligaments of the Digits in 1940 and gave us our understanding of Grayson's ligaments of the digit. Among the surgeons who also championed wide or radical fasciectomy were Knavel, Koch, and Mason. Radical fasciectomy was supported by well-known surgeons like Meyerding, Bennell, Mackendo, Skoog, Webb, Jones, and Povertaff. In 1958, Mackendo stated that no form of treatment other than radical surgery can cure the patient with established Dupuytren's contracture. Aggressive surgical treatment remained popular in the first half of the 20th century, but the complications of radical fasciectomies began to trouble some surgeons, and they began to look for alternative treatment options for their patients. Complications of fasciectomy, including long recovery times, persistent edema, reflex sympathetic dystrophy, hematoma infection, skin necrosis, digital nerve injuries, digital stiffness, and permanent loss of flexion were significant problems for post-operative patients. Not being able to make a fist with subsequent core grip is a more disabling situation than the original loss of extension caused by Dupuytren's disease. The movement Away from radical fasciectomy was championed by many surgeons, but one of the most outspoken was Dr. Patrick Clarkson, who emphatically and loudly spoke against radical fasciectomy with his 1963 paper, The Radical Fasciectomy for Dupuytren Disease, A Condemnation. His work and the work of others moved the consensus of hand surgeons away from radical fasciectomy and towards partial fasciectomy. Clarkson felt the issues of recurrence and persistence were overshadowed by the severe complications of radical fasciectomy. Clarkson also argued that the claims of no recurrence after a radical fasciectomy were unsupported. Reportedly, Eric Moberg once said, What do you mean radical fasciectomy? Amputation of the wrist? Of the many surgeons doing partial fasciectomy, two avid supporters were Tubiana in France and Houston in Australia. Houston also elucidated the involvement of the skin in Dupuytren's disease, described the tabletop test, and the concept of Dupuytren's disease diathesis and its associated high recurrence rate. This unique group were young, had ectopic disease like knuckle pads, positive family history, bilateral disease, were male Caucasians, and usually had onset of disease before age 50. Others who supported limited or partial fasciectomy include Hamlin, Shaw, Howard, and Luck. In 1967, Zachariah's comparative study in 152 patients with long-term results showed similar improvement in extension between radical and partial fasciectomy, but again showed radical surgery caused more complications both early and late. In 1964, McCash in Ireland described leaving the palm open after limited fasciectomy, which he did through transverse incisions. This allowed early active range of motion, prevented hematomas, and avoided the need for skin graft, but the secondary healing did expand the recuperation time. In 1974, McFarlane increased the surgical anatomic understanding of Dupuytren's disease by identifying the various patterns of the disease and describing in detail the pathological cords. Further, he elucidated the role of the myofibroblast in the pathogenesis of Dupuytren's disease. McFarlane's work was preceded by Luck, who in 1959 initiated one of the earliest surgeon-scientist collaborations related to Dupuytren's disease with the study of the histological staging of the disease. Some of the other collaborators who have investigated the basic science of Dupuytren's disease include Gabmiani and Maginot in 72, Stack 73, Mickelson in 1976, Gelberman in 1980, Brickley Parsons and Glimpshire in 1981, Hurst and Battlemente in 1983, Kistner and Speer in 1984, Morrell in 1987, McFarland, Magruder and Flint in 1990, Rayan and Tomasek in 1995, Leclerc in 2000, and Moon in 2004, and many others who followed before and after. In the 1970s and 80s, Houston and Gonzalez recommended dermofasciectomy for recurrent Dupuytren's disease. This fasciectomy was done with wolf-type skin grafts, both in the palm and digit. They felt this provided a, in quotes, fire break in the disease and prevented further recurrence. This was felt to be particularly appropriate for young patients with strong Dupuytren's diathesis. Others showed later that recurrence can occur under a skin graft. In 1993, a new therapeutic choice, the needle aponectomy, was introduced for Dupuytren's disease by Badois and others in Paris, France. 
With this technique, a small needle was put through the skin and manipulated against the Dupuytren's cord repeatedly until the cord ruptured at that level. The procedure was then repeated at other locations along the cord until the finger could be extended. The complications of this technique included nerve damage, infection, skin tear, tendon rupture, significant recurrence rates, but it was low cost, minimally invasive, and could be done as an office procedure. The percutaneous needle fasciectomy technique and indications were further defined by Van Risen, Ter Linden, and Worker in multiple publications between 2006 and 2012. In 1991, an additional minimally invasive surgery, the open segmental epineurotomy, was described by Mormons in Belgium. In this technique, the cord was exposed through small transverse incisions at multiple levels and transected or small portions removed. This minimally invasive procedure could be done as outpatient. In 1996, Hurst and Badalamente showed in the laboratory that Dupuytren's cords from surgical cases could be ruptured after injection with collagenase. Ultimately, phase one, two, and three clinical trials showed this could be done safely and efficaciously in patients as an office procedure. Sanjay, go ahead. Dr. Hurst is going to break the cord. Hello. There you go. Guess what? All done. You fully open? Great. Perfect. In 2010, the use of collagenase Clostridium histolyticum, or CCH, to treat Dupuytren's disease was approved by the FDA in the United States. It has since been used in hundreds of patients to successfully release the Dupuytren's contracture without surgical intervention. Okay, so there's the uh, Y cord, central cord here to the ring finger, natatory to the fifth finger, and we've numbed them up, so we're going to manipulate this. There's the ring finger corrected. Make a fist, sir. Open. Excellent. Relax a minute, see if we can get this natatory cord. There it goes. Make a fist. You okay? Yep. Straighten your hand. Complications included swelling, ecchymosis, small skin tears, temporary enlargement of the lymph nodes, and rarely flexor tendon ruptures. Let us review some of the key points related to the history of Dubatron's disease. One, there is minimal historical evidence regarding Dubatron's disease before the 1600s. Two, the 1700s and 1800s were the dawn of real surgical and medical awareness of this disorder. Three, the therapeutic options that have been defined by the history of Dubatron's disease include open surgery, such as fasciotomy and partial fasciectomy, needle neurotomy and collagenase injection. Four, current academic debates regarding the relationship of Dupuytren's disease to work, the origin of Dupuytren's disease, is it trauma, is it genetic, the best treatment options, etc., are arguments that have been going on since the time of Dupuytren himself, and a true consensus for these issues eludes us. Five, on other medical pioneers diagnosed and treated Dupuytren's disease before Monsieur Guillaume Dupuytren did himself, but with well-established ICD-10 codes for Dupuytren's disease, and thousands of articles entitled Dupuytren's disease and simply the awareness of this name for this disorder, it is unrealistic to change the name of Dupuytren's disease to something else. Beside, Monsieur Dupuytren was a productive, famous surgeon and educator. Six, radical surgery frequently leads to stiff hands with less motion and poor grip and should be left as a historical footnote. Seven, history continues to show us that Dupuytren's disease is not curable and that all current therapeutic options have problems with recurrence and other complication. 7. Dupuytren's disease remains a potential lifelong problem for many patients. Thank you for watching Hand Surgery Resources YouTube video, Dupuytren's Disease, A Historical Review. The historical tale of this orphan disease is an interesting saga woven from Egypt across Europe, North America, and most of the globe. But the true history of Dupuytren's disease is but a footnote in the fascinating history of medicine and barely a grain of sand on the beaches of the world compared to the complex worldwide history of mankind. For more information on Dupuytren's disease, log on to www.handsurgeryresource.org to access our online text, Hand Surgery Source, version 4.0, or download the Hand Surgery Source app at the Apple App Store or on Google Play. Finally, additional educational opportunities are available on Hand Surgery Resources podcasts, which are now live at Apple, Google, and Spotify. The telling of this historical tale, the Dupuytren's disease, was made possible by Hand Surgery Resource. The Dupuytren's history team included Professor H.S. Resource, M.D., Kathy Gebhardt, Medical Illustrator, Megan Doyle Carmody, Logo Artist, Lorraine Merrill, Executive Assistant, Vicki Mullen Giuliani, Social Media Consultant, 
William Redman, web consultant. Scott Evans, character animator consultant from Digital Puppets. Calvin Hugh, musical consultant. Larry Hurst, writer and producer. This production was funded by Hand Surgery Resource and partially supported by an educational grant from Endo Pharmaceuticals.